freezing fog patches in places too, a low of between minus four and minus nine. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Lucinda Horsley. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation, Cross Question, with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. Welcome to Cross Question, LBC's weekly panel debate show. Actually, in the election period, it's twice a week, Mondays and Wednesdays at 8. Uh, you can watch us on the LBC website at lbc.co.uk, on YouTube, at Facebook or Twitter. Joining me in the studio for the next hour are four representatives from four of Britain's smaller parties. We want to give them a voice as well. We, we hear all the time from the Conservatives, Labour, Liberal Democrats, Brexit Party. Well, today we are joined by Julie Gerling, leader of the Renew Party, Councillor Steve Radford, leader of the Liberal Party, William Clouston, leader of the SDP, and Neil Hamilton, UKIP leader in Wales. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Day. On LBC. And of course, you can put your questions to our panel. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. And um, before we go to the questions, I, I want to ask each of you to maybe explain in a minute or, or less exactly what your parties are all about. Because I, I, I suspect our listeners have heard of some of your parties, but maybe not all. Um, let's start with you, Julie Gerling. You used to be a Conservative MEP. You're now leader of Renew. What is Renew all about? Well, as an ex-Conservative, it won't surprise you to hear that we are a centrist party. Uh, I haven't leapt very far to the right or the left of where I was before. Um, we're a centrist party. We are in many ways socially, I would say, more to the left, but uh, fiscally more to the right a little bit. We came about really after the 2017 election, during that period when we suddenly uh, had a Brexit-based election and we found that there were a lot of people who didn't feel that their position on Brexit was really being represented and our position on that's quite clear we're a remain party but we're not we're not ideologically fundamentalist about remain uh, we think it's a huge mistake that the country's making leaving the European Union but we didn't think it was perfect so you won't find me proselytizing for EU as well, it is now. You're very Liberal Democratic to me. Well, no, actually, the difference between us and the Liberal Democrats, and that's a question that we're asked a lot, the difference between us and the Liberal Democrats is that, with the exception of me as the leader, and you'll see I'm always described as the interim leader because I don't want to lead a political party forever, but the difference is that we actually have people who are not political anoraks. And for me, one thing that defines a Liberal Democrat is they're a political anorak. They, 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 they don't seem to see themselves as normal members of society. They're always very committed to the Liberal Democrat cause. Actually, our members and the people who vote for us, they're they're ordinary people with ordinary lives and they want ordinary people well, to represent there, them. There are several million people that vote Liberal Democrat. You, you've just categorised them all as, as obsessives and geeks. No, I haven't categorised <laughs> them all. You, well, I, you said I, they're I not said very that, normal. Well... The, the Liberal Democrats that I've worked with, and I've been on councils, I've been in the European Parliament, they have a certain element, and maybe it's just those that get elected rather than those that elect them, but they have a certain element of fundamentalism, which I don't think sits very well with a lot okay. of people. Um, I'm sure the Liberal Party is nothing like that, Steve Radford. Well, we're, we, are, we have strong political views. We very much believe in an individual market economy. We believe in supporting small businesses. We do support um, community organisations and we believe in quality services and we believe in progressive taxation so those people who are most able to afford can help to do it. Um, I'm really quite comfortable with the accusation we're a committed political party for... Uh, leading communities and uh, um, I think that liberal tradition is a very strong tradition in this country. Uh, and the Liberal Party st exists because it didn't agree with the merger of the Liberal, De liberal Party and the SDP back in the 1980s. Yes, in 88 we were uh, given the choice to join the Social and Liberal Democrat Party or stay as Liberals and I took the view as many Liberals did, well we don't know what the new party stands for Paddy Ashdown says it was going to be a synthesis 
don't know what a synthesis is. So we just stayed as Liberals. And uh, some of us had tried to work with the Lib Dems, um, but they had took a policy of uh, seek out and destroy, which is an incredibly liberal point of view. <laughs> um, uh, I got that in a letter from my local Lib Dems, and I don't feel very sought out and destroyed since. I'm really upset. <laughs> um, we stayed as Liberals, and... Uh, in uh, many councils, we describe ourselves as the constructive opposition. One thing we try and do is find common ground amongst all the parties and produce common sense solutions and try and get consensus. And maybe less obsessed with the party whip and some of the other and more are you traditional sort of parties. Lefty liberals or, or sort of righty Gladstonian liberals? Well, the Gladstonian liberals, as in administration, should be easy and affordable. We certainly agree with raising the tax threshold so people, our way of helping the low paid will be to take them out of the tax traps, not a new layer of handouts. So in that sense, Gladstone Liberals suits me right down to the T. Um, but socially progressive and we believe in high quality services and progressive taxes. So there's a clear liberal tradition there. Uh, we know what we're about. I have to say I'm never quite sure what the Lib Dems are. Seems to flip-flop a lot of times. Well, we're getting a lot of anti-Lib Demery so <laughs> far and I guess, William Clouston, you're going to continue with it. Because you, <laughs> represent the, you, repre you represent the <laughs> SDP. And someone said to me when I tweeted at the that you're all coming on the show and we had a graphic was showing all of your party logos they, they rather unkindly said that we we're going to have a competition to decide whose was the most old-fashioned and ugly and it oh, has well. to be said that none of your party logo well maybe renew is a bit more modern but the sdp what is the point of it well it's actually we trace our uh, origins back to the original sdp i was an active member in the 80s uh, a lot of us resisted the merger rather on the same basis that steve's party did um it's it's come back from the grassroots it's a very interesting story it never died uh what is it politically well it's it's center left on economics uh, i'd say small c conservative uh, on cultural uh, social and cultural issues uh, and I think that is the hidden gap in British politics. It's where probably about half the public are. So we want a strong and capable state. Uh, the flagship policy is the social market policy. It always was, and it still is. Uh, and I think it's something that neither Labour nor the Tories really understand. Uh, so what you're offered is, uh, you know, the Labour Party want a, a bigger state than the market can afford, and the Tories always go for a, a smaller state than the public need. Uh, and and that's the that's the difference. And you're quite Brexity as well. Yeah, we're we're nation state Democrats. Uh, I describe our position as uh, culturally uh, very pro European, uh, but uh, anti EU. Uh, and we've yeah we're we're we, su we support the the the, the present deal. Uh, interestingly, last time you had me on the program, we were arguing for no no deal because May's deal was so bad that uh, it really wasn't wasn't Brexit. And there was no route out of of the EU. But now there is, and I think we should support it. Um, Neil Hamilton from UKIP, uh, you might find it slightly insulting that you're being included in a minor parties debate, but that's where UKIP is now, isn't it? Uh, if temporarily, yes, because the Brexit party has basically stolen our clothes, uh, but I think that's going to be short-lived. I mean, UKIP uh, is in this for the long term. You know, we are the United Kingdom Independence Party. We have a vision of Britain beyond Brexit, and, uh, you know, we want to take back our laws control of our money <coughs> and uh, we want to see uh, members of parliament taking decisions rather than unelected judges and technocrats we want to see a democratic health service for example uh, considering that 15 percent of, of government spending goes on health what influence do people have over the priorities of the health service very little uh, and we want to have uh, elected health boards for example so that priorities can be set by those who use the service we want to see uh, the bloated foreign aid budget dramatically reduced so that it only goes for humanitarian purposes and not for things such as uh, you know, climate change lessons and uh, dance troops to Ethiopia and so on and that money could be spent uh, at home we, we want to, to okay well let's not go through your entire manifesto no. but how many how many seats are you contesting in this we're election? contesting 44 is that all i mean because at last time it was hundreds wasn't it yes well we we took a decision that we didn't want to 
prejudice the election of the of Brexiteers uh, in this general election because however inadequate the deal which uh, Boris has put on the table and, and I agree that it is very very suboptimal uh, it doesn't actually uh, uh, give us a real Brexit at all and the uh, worry is that uh, if Boris is elected that ultimately uh, he's not going to deliver on what we would regard as Brexit but nevertheless he's better than the alternatives certainly better than Corbyn uh, who would turn the country into a kind of Venezuelan disaster and the Lib Dems who are quite explicitly not liberal uh, and not Democrats and they want to reverse the result of the referendum without giving the people a voice in that decision. Okay well let Let's give the people a voice. 0345 6060 973 if you'd like to ask our panel a question. Um, I have to say some of the questions so far are quite niche. Um, Let's see if we can widen it out a little bit uh, in some of the subject matter. That What what are the main issues in the election? What do you want to hear from these four parties in this election campaign? 0345 6060 973. Uh, Let's go to James in Manchester. James, what would you like to ask? Uh, are, are you speaking to myself? I am. You're James, aren't well, I, you? I, I, I am, but I'm feeling I'm in Kent. Oh, OK. <laughs> but it's OK. It's OK that's it's fine. That's problem. fine. You can be in Gillingham. I don't mind where you are. What would you like to ask, James? I'd like to ask the panel, how do they envisage ongoing policing and criminal justice cooperation with the European Union post-Brexit once we've left? Um, William Clouston from the SDP. Oh, well, there have been a lot of scare stories um, uh, about this, uh, as there have been about many other issues. Um, I think there is no reason whatsoever why we can't cooperate uh, post-Brexit. I know that obviously we have institutions that we're presently, uh, we presently participate in, uh, but with goodwill, there's no reason whatsoever why we couldn't uh, continue to, to cooperate with with friends across but now. we won't be part of the european arrest warrant will be so that's going to impact on things. things that's true yeah but why not have an exception in why not why not if it's an important uh, security issue why why wouldn't it be in their interests and our interest to have an exception and cooperate i'm neil hamilton yeah, there's absolutely no reason why independent nations can't cooperate. And people were members of Interpol long before we uh, joined the European Union back in 1973. And yes, we will certainly be out of the European arrest warrant. And a jolly good thing, too, because some countries which don't have the high standards uh, that we have uh, on civil liberties can issue arrest warrants without going through due process. And uh, you can't Uh, those warrants are not justiciable in British courts so we've had some uh, grotesque examples of people who've been extradited to jurisdictions elsewhere in the EU where it's doubtful whether they'd get a fair trial. Well we we have, that is absolutely right but on the other hand there are lots of cases that have gone the other way around if you you look at the balance of them the balance would overwhelmingly surely be in Britain's favour Well, the balance is to be decided in the courts and uh, uh, it's been the the judges in the past who've decided whether it's in the interest of justice as a whole for people to be extradited to another country. One of the key questions is whether they'll get a fair trial and whether they'll be treated to the standards that British justice requires. You can't say that about countries like Romania or Bulgaria or even Cyprus uh, because we've had some of the worst examples from those parts of the world. Julie Gerling, what, what about the cooperation um, on databases, for example, security databases, which we won't be able to, well, they won't be able to have information from us and we won't be able to have inf- information from them. That has surely got to mean um, that the system is not going to be to our benefit in the future. Well, certainly that's something that concerns me. Um, it's very true that uh, you can always make, uh, you can always make, arrangements but those arrangements by definition will be more difficult more clunky than they currently are Uh, that's why we're leaving because we don't want to have these seamless arrangements or at least that's what i'm told Um, we want to retain our nation state sovereignty over issues like information Uh, certainly things like a shared uh, data platform the basis on which we allow people's information to be shared is shared now by 28 member states so we will be in the position where i'm sure that we will be able to negotiate at some point um, it, whether it's a priority or not i don't know but we will be able to i'm sure negotiate being part of that but by definition we will have to join what they've already agreed at the moment we're part of that agreement actually a really strong part when it comes to security because we've got very well developed security um, ish, infrastructure in our own country we we overplay at that 
uh, we will be in the position where we will have to take their rules in the future if we want to be part okay. of it, and that's the problem. Can I just make a point about harass warrants? Because you're absolutely right. The UK executes by far the largest number of arrest warrants, removing non-UK nationals who have committed criminal offences in the UK. It's, it's a factor, I can't remember exactly, but it's, it's a large factor. We are the, the country that has the most warrants but you, you mentioned in the UK. You mentioned intelligence and the military intelligence in the Five <laughs> Eyes. These are five sovereign states, independent nations working together. It's absolutely indispensable. So to think that it's that we can't do this for some reason is, is wrong. Steve Radford. I think um, the, I think I would agree with Neil. The, we've had some horrific stories about, particularly in some of the East European countries, a, a European arrest warrant has been undermining basic principles of justice. And the security arrangements in this country are far superior than many of the European countries. Let's be quite honest about it. And I don't mean that in, in any glib way or nationalist way. Um, our, our, our security intelligence networks have been a, a, um, a very high standard. And we have cooperation and data sharing with other NATO countries which aren't in the EU. Um, I don't know where everybody's got this sudden idea that all the good practices in government happened when the EU came along and then didn't exist before. Um, we had employment laws, we had data protection, we have police intelligence systems well in place before the EU and we'll have them after. You're sounding quite brexit -y yourself. Um, well, I do believe in leaving the EU. I think we should be a global-facing country. Liberals have always been internationalist. We should face the whole world and we should be flexible in our relationships relationships across the whole world that's so always been well, a liberal can I, can tradition I, say, I, think panel. I think this is the first time in the history of broadcasting Hurrah! anywhere in the country that we've had a panel with three brexiteers and one remainer and you have to invite <laughs> me <laughs> with them thank well, you sorry Ian. Julie Ian. Yeah, but yeah, Julie, just, Julie, Julie rights for minorities Julie when we, when we get to the brexit questions you're inevitably going to have to have more time aren't absolutely. you so absolutely you, just evening it up you, you win because they're win, all going to say the same thing you win thing. anyway um <laughs> Let's take a text here. Um, Kevin in Tottenham says, Can you please ask the STP leader, William, why he defended the prominent STP member Rod Little when Little implied Muslims should not vote? I get that freedom of speech is a treasure. However, everything is tolerated, but what is promoted speaks volumes about the party that promotes such material. What Clouston promoted made me very uncomfortable. I didn't promote it. Anyway, uh, it's, a good, it's a good question. No, I didn't agree with him. Rod wrote, so Rod writes um, three columns a week. He's got the uh, Sun and the Spectator and the Ti Sunday Times. And um, he's often quite controversial, as you know. Um, he wrote something in The Spectator, a piece in The Spectator, about um, uh, jokingly about how you would suppress the, the Labour vote. And he suggested, I mean, context is everything, Ian, as you know. So a lot of what people did was clip part of the article and say, isn't this outrageous? So context is everything. He also, in that piece, the first joke was that if you had students as, as sons or daughters, you should uh, use horse tranquilizers on them to stop them voting. And then he said, why not have a, uh, an election day on a, on a Muslim holy day? It was a joke. Obviously, it was a joke. If you, if you get the first joke, you'd get the second one. Um, so it's it's it's... I mean, so whenever anybody makes uh, a comment that c most people would construe as fairly racist, we should just treat it as a joke. Well, the, y y Islam is a religion, so it's not a race. So uh, that's that's all right. That's Islamophobic, the, then. Well, you could say it was you're Islamophobic. Ne you're you, I, so he can't, so he's, he's not allowed to make any jokes about Islam. No, I didn't say he's, that. He's, uh, in the past, in the past six months, or certainly nine months, he's upset the Welsh. In fact, the, the police were involved. Actually, I, d I can't remember what, what he okay. said. Okay. So he my my point is, it, my point, my but no, not no. He's a he's a very uh, he's a very very um, uh, valued SDP member, but he is quite eccentric. He's in a, a polemicist, and society needs people like Rod Little. Do, do you have to be eccentric to to support your four political parties? I mean, you, Neil, you would class yourself as a bit of an eccentric, I, I imagine. Well, I, after fifty years in politics, I think I must be <laughs> clinically mad rather than just eccentric. But but, it, but, a, but it, is, it is a case, possibly less so. Julie, with, with your party, but also, Steve, I think people have accused your party of being slightly eccentric. Well, I'm going to be honest, they? I remember when I joined the Liberal Party at 14, Joe Grimmond was on the TV and said liberalism was about the, the British right to be eccentrics, which I thought was quite, <laughs> quite rather, rather appealing. Right, let's, um, let's go to another question. Uh, Graham is a first-time caller in Finchley. Hello, Graham. Hello. Hi. What would you like to ask? Um, I'd like to um, clarify. Um, Neil Hamilton says that um, Boris's deal is not really Brexit, but William Clouston thinks that it's better than Theresa May's, and uh, it is Brexit. So I'd like them to elaborate and explain why they've reached that conclusion. 
Well, we've got a border down the middle of the Irish Sea, which Boris said that he was never going to agree to. And uh, although Northern Ireland will be part of the British customs area, it will be treated very differently and have to accept rules and regulations which are made in Brussels for the foreseeable future. And it's true that the deal does include a provision which enables the Northern Ireland Assembly to decide on a, uh, an intermittent basis whether it wants this arrangement to continue. But as we know, the Northern Ireland Assembly hasn't met for God knows how long and in current circumstances is unlikely to meet in the foreseeable future. It also means that uh, if you look at the political declaration, that we are committed to having a kind of level playing field in regulation between Britain and the no, EU going forward. Yes, it does. No, that, that, that's, what, that's one of the things that he achieved. I mean, it's now not in the withdrawal mm. agreement, mm. it's yeah. in the political declaration. Well, that's, sorry. So it's not a legally it's binding legal. thing. No, it's not, but that's the background well, there, there against... So he's got rid of the no, backstop, he's no. got rid of the regulatory alignment thing. What, what, what is there no. not to like about that, that from your point well, of view? Because the, the precondition for a free trade agreement with the EU is going to be that we have a high level of regulatory alignment. And my fear is but we negotiate that. Yeah. It's not. It's not in the legally binding part of the deal. No. That's the point. No. But my my fear is that uh, Boris is going to give this away post. Uh, 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 Brexit. But do you not get that your ideological purism on this is actually threatening Brexit yeah. anyway? Because it, it, if you don't accept this, and uh, look, I have my reservations about it at the, at the start, but it, it is out of the political uh, and legal structures of the EU. It's out of the single market. It's out of the customs union. Um, you are 70 to 80 percent out, if not 100 percent. If you go on with your purism, you are risking Brexit completely no, if there's I'll, another hung parliament. No, I'll continue to argue for what I believe is a true Brexit. But that's not to say that I'm going to project prejudice the result of this election by standing in seats where uh, okay. a Remainer is elected instead right, of a Brexiteer. Well, I'll, I'll come to you in a second. Um, Steve, let's come to you next. Well, I very much agree with your comments you were making earlier. I think we've got to be quite honest with it. Brexit is, I think, going to be a fundamental problem if we, if we ignore the wishes of the people and don't deliver a pragmatic, practical Brexit then Parliament would have undermined parliamentary democracy in this country. If you're going to deliver a package, then you've got to have a degree of compromise, compromise within the UK and compromise with Europe. Um, if Liberal Party candidates are elected, which we hope they will on the 12th of December, we will be supporting a pragmatic Brexit deal. I think if we can talk about Northern Ireland, let's face it, Northern Ireland is changing demographically, it's changing politically, and we should be pragmatic about it the fact is the 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 northern irish population didn't vote for brexit by large number including large numbers of the unionist community which i would personally feel affinity to the border has never been effective i'm going to be honest we even when the RAF had stations and the army had patrols the border was always a porous border so i think we've got to have a little bit of honesty about the northern ireland situation it's never been a practical border in every sense and the irish sea is a natural border so i think the government's been quite sensible about this and the, if, if we go down the pluralist line i think we are in danger in doing in uh, endangering brexit and giving the remainers an opportunity to sabotage it as they have done in the last parliament and i think the british population large number of the voters i'm meeting from all different backgrounds are actually want to get a practical brexit deal and i think the majority of business people also believe that in three or four years the relationship will evolve okay. it won't be a one-off thing it's got to be have an evolving relationship julie girling from renew well of course i'm a remainer and there's no good Brexit uh, for me. I think the issue between Boris's and Theresa's deal is really minimal, makes very little difference to me, because, in fact, the big difference is either two years transition or one, with a possibility of maybe having two, but he won't tell us whether he will take that possibility up. Because, actually, it's, it's really not worth anything beyond the end of next year. The, pe the paper it's written on is worth nothing, because we will be back into cliff edge territory when we have to renegotiate um, the final deal and that territory then we will, we will be between the rock and the hard place again because do we leave with a Brexit that most Brexiters just want a Brexit or do we, do we leave with a clean Brexit in other words no regulatory alignment no 
and complete divergence. I don't think any of that has been resolved with either Theresa May's deal or Boris's. I so think that's, absolutely that's right. very dishonest to the British people. Uh, mm. I think to tell the British people that you're going to get Brexit done, which is Boris's shtick, it's, that it, it's, a, it's a lie. It's another lie. It's not going okay. to be done. Uh, William, uh, the criteria for, for us at the start was uh, where do you want to go? Where do you want to end up? And for us, we wanted a, a, a Canada-style free trade agreement. That's where we wanted to go. And the reason that we didn't support the Barnier May deal is that we didn't believe, because of the backstop uh, provisions, that the, the UK could, on its own accord, decide to, to, to leave ever. Um, whether it, I mean, the question of high alignment or, or low alignment is, is an important one, um, and you've got to ask yourself what the EU is. If you stay in the customs union and the single market, you're still in, in our view. Uh, so now we have a situation where we believe with the Johnson-Barnier deal, yes, you can, it's possible to get out to Canada, which is where we want to be, which is why we supported it, which incidentally is why uh, in our 20 candidates that we have up and down the country, uh, all of them are majorities in the thousands. We will not. It's impossible for the SDP's intervention in this election to, to harm Brexit. And I've, I've been on record, and I've said on, on record, and we may talk about it later, but um, the prospect of a Corbyn government is so bad, uh, we would say that the safest option for the country is a Johnson win. But you're still standing candidates. Yeah, but I think in Cunnan Valley and, J uh, and Jarrah, I can't mention them, can I? Because you're going to have to... In, in the places you, you where... Can, you can mention them, but uh, I just don't mention the candidates. OK. Well, in the places we're standing, they're very, very big Labour heartland majorities, which is where we see our target uh, mm. uh, area. So that's what we've done, and uh, I think it's a good it's a good strategy. Okay. Right, we will take more of your calls in a moment. 0345 973 is the number to call. Uh, if you can put your questions to Neil Hamilton from UKIP, William Clouston from the SDP, Steve Radford from the Liberal Party and Julie Girling from Renew. Don't forget also you can watch us via the LBC website. So all that coming up in the next half an hour. You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's coming up to half past eight. News headlines with Lucinda Horsley. Boris Johnson's promised to postpone further cuts to corporation tax in an attempt to save £6 billion. He says the money would go towards priorities for British people, like the NHS. Jeremy Corbyn set out Labour's plans to create a climate apprenticeship programme. The leader of the Lib Dems, Joe Swinson, says Brexit will be bad for jobs and trade. Two teenagers have been jailed for life for the murder of Jodie Chesney in a park in East London. The 17-year-old was stabbed as she was sitting in a park with friends in Harold Hill in March. And a lawyer representing some of Jeffrey Epstein's accusers is calling on Prince Andrew to speak voluntarily to US authorities. Gloria Allred says the Duke of York may have information as they investigate the billionaire paedophile. LBC weather very cold with a widespread frost across the UK tonight. Some freezing fog with a low of between minus four and minus nine. Sunny spells to start tomorrow, a high of 10 degrees. This is LBC. Once in a while, a movie comes along that leaves critics and audiences breathless. That movie is Le Mans 66. We are going to beat a Ferrari with a Ford. Are you nuts? Starring Academy Award winners Matt Damon and Christian Bale. They hate guys like us because we're different. Don't miss the incredible true story of Ford v Ferrari. Trust me. It's one of the year's must-see films. It's sensational. A triumph. Together, we're going to make history. Le Mans 66. You're going to want to see in cinemas and IMAX now. This winter, why not take the short flight from London to Dublin with Aer Lingus from just £32.99 each way as part of a return trip. From coastal walks to cosy pubs and friendly locals, you'll find so much to enjoy once you're there. Smart takes a Dublin city break. Smart flies Aer Lingus. Book now at aerlingus.com. Terms and conditions apply. Marooned in deep space and no sign of help. Don't panic. I'm with the AA. The app lets you track the mechanic right to your side. I'm thinking of joining the AA. No, I don't think they accept cats as members. Who said anything about being a member? I want one of those shiny yellow jackets. Ow! There are lots of smart reasons to join the AA. You'll get unlimited call-outs, our tap and track app, and we'll get you going again in around 30 minutes of arrival. Switch to a different kind of breakdown service from just £5 a month. Visit the AA.com. New customers only. T's and C's apply. Shoes off, slippers on. There's nothing like coming back to a warm home after a long day at work, especially when you've been stuck in rush hour for what seems like an eternity. Luckily, with Hive Active Heating, you can turn your heating on from wherever you are. And with our Black Friday offer, enjoy 25% off. 
plus a free Amazon Echo Dot. Search Hive Heating to buy now. Hive services require broadband and Wi-Fi. Terms apply. Offer ends 2nd December. You're in leakage, you're in leak. Antenna, men, K pants, and pads. You're buy online or in shops. You're Antenna, men, keep control. Money. How does that word make you feel? You might be thinking about what you'd love to spend it on, or what you have to spend it on. Maybe you think you're just bad with money, but here's the thing. You're not. You're just with the wrong bank. At Starling Bank, we want you to feel good about money. So we built a personal and business bank account with clever budgeting tools, instant payment alerts, and no fees when you spend overseas. Starling Bank. Voted Britain's best bank twice. Download the app today. Smart Money People Awards. Eligibility criteria applies. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 8.33, it's our minor parties debate with Neil Hamilton from UKIP, William Clouston from the SDP, Steve Radford from the Liberal Party and Julie Girling from the Renew Party. Let's go to your questions. Uh, Luca is in Lansing. Hello, Luca. Hello, good evening. Hi, what's your question? Um, are your party memberships experiencing growth as a result of the combined veilers of the major parties? Well, that's a good question. I mean, do you find that you're all starting to thrive now because people are so disappointed and unhappy with the performances of the other parties. Um, Steve Radford. Yes, totally. Um, we've got a, a lot of growth of people. Uh, we've had a lot of people who are traditionally see themselves as Labour moderate voters um, looking for a socially progressive party which respects the referendum. Uh, we've, I think we're going to get a big surge in uh, voters and we've already had it in members from uh, the Labour Party. We're also getting a lot of Lib Dems who just don't feel comfortable with the view of I'm a Liberal but now I don't believe in majority voting and I don't agree with a referendum and I don't agree with this referendum but I object to a Scottish referendum. It's so we've, it? we've got picked up quite a few ex-Lib Dem members. 25% of Liberal Democrat voters voted for Brexit, mm. which everyone thinks that not a single one of them. No, I, 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 but, but if you think of the Liberal tradition of free trade and, and belief in reducing tariffs to, to keep products and international trades beneficial then it's quite obvious there would be a very high proportion of, 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 of Brexit voters amongst the Liberal tradition. So I'm, I'm going to give you all the opportunity to plug your websites where presumably people can join up if they like the cut of your jib tonight. What's your website? Uh, www.liberal.org.uk Simple as that. Julie Curling. Renewparty.org.uk And, and how... Because I've been quite interested in the Renew Party because we, we had Annabel Mullins, who I now think has gone to the... Has she gone to the Liberal Democrats? No, she was a Liberal Democrat. She's she's left Could, politics for the time oh, being right? for, um, for family reasons. Because I, I, I was quite interested in a lot of the people that you seem to be recruiting into the leading positions in Renew. They, they all seem to be quite sort of 30s, 40s, quite middle class, bit bit sort of like we imagine the SDP of the 1980s. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, I'm looking at the hamster, future. Hamster, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's true to say that most of our members are young. Um, they, they tend to be mostly uh, metropolitan. We're quite heavily concentrated in London, although we do have branches throughout the country and we are building, uh, for example, we're standing a candidate in Edinburgh, so we are, we are building on that. We've had a lot of interest. We don't really run a traditional party membership model, um, we c you can be a member. It's quite expensive. Uh, we're not expecting. How much? It's fifty pounds. Fifty pounds. Wow, that me. proves what, it. What do you get for your fifty quid? Uh, you get loved. Um, <laughs> and they <It> were. <laughs> Dear me, you stamped that out. But but it's supporters we're after. It's supporters we're after, and okay. and we don't ask people to sign up to be members. This is you know we're twenty first century. We're looking for supporters. We're we're looking for people to broadly sign up to our values. And uh, we listen to them. We have, for example, an online policy forum. So our, we have closed discussions if you're a supporter where you can contribute uh, to policy development. And, you know, that can sometimes lead you up to some very interesting alleys. And it's, it's, but it's, it's nothing, a new way of doing things. Nothing is ever closed on the internet, is it? <laughs> um, Neil Hamilton, now at, at, at its peak, UKIP had, what, 40,000, 50,000 members. What, what's your membership like now? Well, it's about 20,000 now. Really? Still 20,000? We, we, we obviously lost a lot of members or rather members not renewing 
uh, because of the Brexit party. But I, I think a lot of them are now pretty disappointed because they've sent money off to Nigel, but they don't become members of the Brexit party because it's actually it doesn't have members, a company does it? and Nigel is the proprietor rather than the leader of the party. And uh, so, as we've seen in this election, you know, candidates have been stood down uh, uh, without being consulted and there's a lot of disenchantment of the Brexit party. So we're hoping that with this election out of the way and on the assumption that Boris uh, delivers what he's promising on Brexit at the very least, that we will then regroup and a lot of members who in the last six months have not renewed will come back to UKIP because we have a full programme of policies for life in Britain it's beyond just, Brexit. You don't have a leader at the moment, I gather. No, we don't. We have an interim leader that was appointed last oh, Saturday. Who's that? Uh, this has passed me by. Well, she's uh, Pat, her name is Pat Mountain. She's the chairman of UKIP in the South East. But it's only for uh, the ten weeks or so that it uh, will be between. How many leaders? Our previous have you leader had in, in the last couple of years. Is uh, it, is it ten something. Well, like it's that? been a kind of annual event, really. <laughs> <laughs> and like Christmas, uh, and uh, Except not quite with the same effect. No, same, quite exactly. the same joy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, William Clouston, what, what's your membership? Uh, it's low thousands still. So we're sw still a small party. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, the leadership of the Leave campaign has been very market liberal, Thatcherite economics. That, those are the people on both both campaigns. Very, very but, but five million people on the left, centre left to left, voted for Brexit. And they have no party until we came along. I mean, basically, we're the only centre left. You're not on the left. We're, well, not by any traditional we meaning are, of the no, word. No, I did disagree totally, In uh, Read the new declaration. Have a look at the policy. So, nationalise the railways, build council houses, increase the minimum wage. Or A lot of the policies are very, very interventionist, very social market. The social market side is absolutely square. It's certainly to the left of anything that Tony Blair did. That's certainly true. Uh, what people get confused about is the is the is the blue in the colours, which is the is the social conservatism. But that is. And what, what do you mean by that? Social conservatism. Well, faith. Means sort of it used to it used to be sort of anti-abortion, no, anti-gay. No, nothing like that. No. Okay. No. It's, what does it mean then? It, it means basically uh, a respect for tradition, a respect for the nation state. Uh, a communitarian approach to politics rather than very, very individualistic attitude, uh, and, and speaking up for the family, which is a big okay. thing. That's a big thing um, in our party. Luca, are you attracted to any of these parties? Um, I was a member of one of the parties uh, here. Which, uh, which one? Until recently, where some events from within the party caused me to be very uh, questionable of my membership. Uh, I, I'm sensing it could be UKIP. Uh, I, I can't say what party it would be, but uh, it was it was a rather recent event. Okay. All right. Well, if you're going to be so coy, I'm not going to I'm not going <laughs> to pr proceed with that one. Um, let's go to Torin in Aberystwyth. Hello, Torin. Hi, Ian. Um, Hi. So my question is basically around fracking, um, and the Conservative government has decided to suspend fracking, but it hasn't ruled out giving the green light to it in the future. So do the party leaders support banning fracking in full? And what do you propose to do about climate change in general? Julie Gerling. Yes, uh, we support a ban on fracking, um, partly because of the unknown environmental impacts, um, but mostly because we believe that we should be moving out of fossil fuels. So it seems ridiculous to start developing technologies to get more fossil fuel out of the ground. Um, fracking works perhaps in areas where there's low population. That's You can't describe the UK as being low population. It's, it's the wrong technology to solve a problem that we don't really have. Um, so we would be uh, in quite happy if this moratorium continued and became a ban. In terms of our climate change policies, I think um, we're quite radical. We believe that we can get to net zero by 2035. We, uh, our policies for doing so would be a mixture of renewables in terms of the energy mix. Um, we support nuclear in terms of the energy mix, which is where perhaps we differ from some of the greener parties. We believe in the planting of more trees, both in the UK and globally. And indeed, I'm not one who is against the foreign aid budget. In fact, I'm very proud of what Britain does with our foreign aid budget. But I'd like to see more of it go to climate change, not less. So diametrically opposed uh, there to Neil. And I'd like to, I think that we could certainly encourage uh, all kinds of action globally through that okay. because people do get a little bit tired telling, telling them they should do it here and then they're not doing it elsewhere. William. 
Um, we haven't. We we published. We had our first policy board for you know probably ten, fifteen years uh, in January. We haven't got detailed. Ten, policy. fifteen. Yeah, years. yeah, yeah. Okay. A proper policy board. Right. Proper policy board. We we generated uh, uh, about two it's like over two hundred. Chinese Communist Party. Well, well you're, you're <laughs> ten year plan. Yes. You know, now we're doing it every year, every 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 oh, January. So but we, so we have two hundred and twenty <laughs> policy pledges. We don't have one on fracking. Uh, I think we'll take a very cautious view on that. As far as climate change in general is concerned, we've published policy on that. Um, um, we, we're, we're looking at carbon capture. That's where the, the, the British uh, effort should go. We've also got a policy for afforestation on uplands, which is, is quite interesting. Uh, which uh, every time we every time the SDP publishes policy, other other parties nick. I mean, Boris Johnson nicked the uh, the uh, corporation tax uh, uh, policy today. We published that in January, and it's conservative policy now. Um, so yeah, another another very important aspect is, is public transport actually in cities. Mm. Which uh, I mean, every major city. I mean, Liverpool, Leeds, Manchester, Sheffield. Uh, you know, Newcastle has a metro centre, uh, metro system, but none of the others do have a proper system. And you've got to get uh, people out of cars into public okay. transport. Steve, well, certainly on um, we, we've taken a lot of research into fracking. Our, our councillors in Rydell have led part of the anti-fracking campaign. I think there's clear evidence it's dangerous. Uh, to the ecology so we, we want a total ban and I think the monitorium is welcome but I'm a bit cynical as it just being plucked out for the election uh, for, there's some practical things to be done I mean, we've been trying to get councils up and down the country to use section 106 development monies and put into solar panels for community buildings which would save public money used to support public ventures and reduce some of the uh, environmental problems it was really disastrous the government withdrew the uh, the payback on solar panels we really want to get this reinstated and public transport is a must um even in the regions public transport is is hodgepodge uh, it depends which part of liverpool you're in um the money being wasted on hs2 could be put into local infrastructure for really public transport yeah. that is a mill must yeah. It's a white elephant we Neil can't Halton, afford. Very quickly, if we can. Well, climate change is always with us. You know, we've had periods of warming and periods of cooling over thousands of years, and there's no evidence that what's happening now is in any way out of kilter with what we've known in previous centuries. I mean, the the uh, increase in temperature since pre-industrial times is one degree centigrade. So we're not uh, talking so you're, about you're the end, all the end of the world. And uh, the question is, you know, can we actually do anything about climate change by all these hugely expensive uh, uh, policies which other parties believe in? But we, this is the greatest we, we, transfer we, we, of wealth in my lifetime from the poor to the rich. That's what we need to realise about this, that what we're doing is deliberately impoverishing people in this country and the people who are suffering most from it, from Increases in fuel prices, for example, keeping warm in the winter, are those at the bottom of the income heap. But we did close the hole in the ozone layer, didn't we? Um, that, that was the big environmental issue of the late 1980s, early 1990s. You never hear about that anymore. It's because no, it, government action CFCs. basically yeah. stopped it. Yeah, but uh, that's a different issue altogether. Well, it's to, allied, though, but, isn't it? It seems you hear nothing about acid rain anymore, but, uh, which was a big issue in the 1970s. Mm. But in the 1970s... Again, because but in the 1970s... The scientific consensus was not about global warming, but about, but about global cooling. You know, I'm old enough and have been active in politics long enough to be able to remember those days. And uh, global global cooling is coming in the ice I mean, interglacial. You, you, that's that's perfectly true. In yeah. Right, we're yeah. going to have many more questions. If you'd like to watch us, you can find out which of our panelists is a Rudolf Giuliani looky likey clue. It's not Julie Girling. <laughs> Thank God. Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three is the number to call. It's eight forty. James O'Brien, Monday to Friday from 10am. Rules are very important. The more you are committed to a hierarchical structure, particularly a class structure, you really need rules. People have to know their place. But the bit they never tell you is that the rules don't apply to the people at the very top. He just thinks he can behave with impunity and then he's going to give an interview, wave a little, do a bit of royally rhetoric and everyone will forgive him. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. Credit limit of up to £1,500. What do you have to do to get it? Simple. Get online and check if you're eligible for an Ocean credit card in minutes without affecting your credit score. For your Ocean credit card, visit ocean.co.uk now and get all that from Ocean. Intelligent Lending Limited is a credit broker. Capital One, the exclusive lender. Representative 39.9% APR variable. Borrow and spend responsibly. Thanks. Thanks a lot. 
Thank you. If you've already got one of the 13 million smart meters installed across Britain, we'd just like to say thank you. Our electricity needs are predicted to double by 2050, so we have to upgrade our outdated energy system. Just by having a smart meter in your home, you'll be helping the system to better anticipate demand and reduce waste. So we just like to say, thank you for getting the smart meter. From the Campaign for a Smarter Britain. I can't pretend to be a great celebrity. Whatever the size of your business, now you can take card payments square and fair. Get next business day payments as standard with no monthly fees and free point of sale software. Learn more at square.com slash fair. Authorised by the Financial Conduct Authority for the provision of payment services. Terms and fees at square.com slash fair. That works the thing on me, Bob. Hey phone, connect to Wi-Fi. Connecting to cyber criminals. You're not listening. I said Wi-Fi. I'm listening. Cyber criminals could be too. Using Wi-Fi could leave your personal data exposed. How can I keep it private? With a secure VPN that encrypts your data, you need new Norton 360. It has multiple layers of protection, including VPN, device security, password manager, and more. Ooh. Go to uk.norton.com to get all-in-one protection starting at twenty-four ninety-nine for your first year. Terms apply. That's uk.norton.com. Global Player. Radio, playlists, and podcasts. Where it's all together. And all for free. So, whatever your mood. Whatever you're doing. And wherever you're going. Tackling the biggest stories. And the issues that matter. Global Player. Download it from your app store now. With the new Halifax Family Boost Mortgage, children can get help to buy their first home and mum and dad earn interest on their savings. Everyone's a winner. Everyone's a winner, baby, that's true. The new Halifax Family Boost Mortgage. Halifax makes it happen. Your home and savings could be at risk if mortgage repayments are not maintained. Only available in England and Wales. One applicant must hold a Halifax reward or ultimate reward current account. Conditions and exclusions apply. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 8.49 is the time here on LBC. Our panel is Steve Radford, otherwise known as Rudolph Giuliani, leader of the Liberal Party, Julie Girling, leader of the Renew Party, William Clouston, leader of the SDP, and Neil Hamilton, UKIP leader in Wales. Let's go to Navid, who is in Glasgow. Navid, what's, what's your question, please? Hi, good evening. Hi. Good evening, panel. Hi, Hi. Ian. Uh, first of all, you know, I'd like to say that uh, your credit uh, to that young man that you spoke to last week uh, regarding his immigration status. Oh, I think I remember, yes. Yes, I uh, just wanted to say well done for offering to support him. Uh, I would like to ask the panel um, if they saw the Prince Andrew interview. Um, did you all see the Prince Andrew interview? Yes, yeah, part I did. Part. Julie not, but um, Neil and uh, William, yes. Yeah, I uh, just want to get the panel's opinions. Do they feel that Prince Andrew should actually now volunteer to give an interview to the States? Um, I've been watching the news and the lady who's actually doing, who's undertaking the legal aspects of this case in, New- in San Francisco, I think it is, has asked the Prince Andrew to volunteer to give a statement to the police. Okay. Um, William uh, So I've only seen parts and I've read about it um, It seems an astonishing interview uh, Very insensitive, uh, doesn't really address the victims of this And certainly if he's certainly if he's asked, if he's needed in the States for testimony, he should go Do you, do you think that given the total misjudgment of doing this interview um, Is it time that he stood back from public life now, maybe retired into obscurity? A, a period of silence probably would be a good idea yeah. Neil? Well, I don't think he, he covered himself with glory in p- PR terms, uh, and uh, I think he should follow the Queen's example. You know, the least said, the soonest mended. I couldn't even is begin. That, is that advice that you might have followed once or twice well, in I your career? Well, I didn't exactly <laughs> uh, take that course of action. I, I decided to move into the world of comedy and entertainment instead. Maybe that's the answer for him. Maybe he should do Strictly Come Dancing, oh my goodness. or I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, or, or the Comedy Fringe mm. at the Edinburgh Festival, which is what I did. Not a laughing matter, though. <laughs> No, indeed. Um, Julie? Well, I think that just sums it up. I mean, I I thought the point... I I didn't see the interview, but I've seen bits and I've read about it, and I thought the point was not... was that he didn't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Despite everything, um, he still didn't seem to understand the gravity of what had happened. And, you know, this sort of laughing and joking does Mm -hmm. that too. I think this is a really serious thing. Mm -hmm. Um, 
he's not in my view a big figure in public life anyway so he wouldn't be terribly missed so i think he should uh, cooperate if he's asked by the u.s authorities and just take himself out of public life okay. uh, for the rest of his uh, natural steve well um i only saw part of the interview but it didn't come over as considering the wider issues it came very much defensive i think that was done no good at all if the public authorities in the united states want his cooperation he should give it forthcomingly i think a period of graceful declining from public life um whilst reflecting on what's happened may not may be a very wise caution but can i say i'm an adamant constitutional monarchist and i think the monarchy does us a lot of good but sometimes when they get it wrong a bit of humility goes a long way mm. um navid what's the answer to your own question well, I think he should, but it shouldn't even come down to the monarchy. End of the day, um, I think based on what I saw, uh, Andrew lacked a sense of humanity and compassion and understanding. Uh, he dehumanised the victims, I felt, with his uh, comments. She did him like a commodity. That's just my opinion, but I think it's just the way I felt when I watched it, that he seemed to minimise the suffering. And he actually, how can you... Uh, knowing that a person is a paedophile or being alleged and charged as a paedophile, how can you spend four days at someone's house when you've got the British consulate, which I think is three blocks down from that street? It is a good question, David. Thank you very much. And we're going to be talking about Prince Andrew after nine on the programme, getting your views on what his future in public life ought to be, if there is one. Uh, Kenny's in Northwood. Kenny, what's your question, please? Uh, thank you, Ian, for taking my call. Uh, the question is, when is the government going to bring back weekly payments for those on benefit and for those in work to help stop people getting into debt and having to live off credit? Well, we haven't got a government representative here, but let's see what our panellists think about that. Steve Radford. Well, I think um, the complexity of our benefit system is a major problem. And the other thing I really do say is I cannot understand why someone working a 37-hour week on a national minimum wage is still paying income tax. Mm -hmm. What we need to do... There's two ways of dealing with the low pay and poverty in this country is another more complex system of benefits or actually raise the tax thresholds. And I'm a great believer we should put back incentives to work and we should actually raise tax thresholds, which also help pensioners as well. Well, the government have done that, haven't they? Uh, they have, but it was their last priority at the end of the, the, the four years, not the beginning, when they gave the monies to the, those people in the highest paid brackets. Well, hang on a minute. They, they've doubled the tax-free allowance from 6500 to 12500 over a period of nine years. That, that's yeah. quite something. But in, I mean, the first coalition government, the, the first tax breaks went out for the, the most well-off and at the end, the end of the four years went off to the low paid. And I think we really do need to start lifting people okay. out of tax benefit Julie? system. Well, if I understand the question, I think the issue is this... Uh, the with the universal benefit system the system was brought in that didn't recognize that some months had more than four weeks in them and therefore some people who are really at the at the end of the spectrum that are in real need were left with weeks maybe three or four weeks in one calendar year where they didn't get a payment and somebody made a decision based on what was best for accountants rather than understanding the lives that yeah. people are leading so i think the government should put that right straight away it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Neil Hamilton. Well, UKIP's uh, manifesto in 2017 proposed that anybody who was on minimum wage would uh, not be paying income tax. So I think that's absolutely right. Uh, and the benefit system is an impossibly complicated maze, though point of universal credit was to try to synthesize it so that uh, people could understand but it was a botched rollout and the idea that people could survive for a month without yeah, exactly. actually any yeah. money being uh, put into their bank account was an absurd uh, uh, and have you so. seen that what from your constituents in wales did people contact you complaining about this yes we've all had uh, hard luck cases and you know, the, the, these cases do inspire the greatest possible sympathy it's the triumph of bureaucracy over humanity that's mm. the problem with this not that ian duncan smith uh, was in any way inhumane he's one of the most humane 
people that are, I've ever known. But once the bureaucracy gets its hands upon uh, a system of rules and regulations, this it becomes an inflexible system, and that that was the problem. The government, of course, have, uh, have nudged it since then. But nevertheless, it's still the case okay. that it does produce uh, impossible circumstances for otherwise well-deserving people. William Cluson from the SDP. Um, I think, in principle, the universal credit system and the when it was originated at the um, CSJ, good idea, but very, very poorly implemented. And, and the, uh, the mistake the Tories made was making it too ideological in the rollout. So they wanted people to sort of budget over four and five weeks, and it fell apart. I mean, in a terrible, terrible error. Um, the policy that we have is to introduce a, a citizen's bank, which would help some of the payments to landlords and so on and get the flow, because it was that, that was the issue. It wasn't that the money wasn't there. It was the, it was the tragedy of the policy. The money was there, but the flow wasn't wasn't mm. wasn't connected. Uh, so less ideology, more pr- or more practical. Okay. Um, final tax question. We always like to finish off with something vaguely amusing. Uh, Sam in Maidstone says it was announced today that uh, Sir Paul McCartney will be headlining Glastonbury next year. Who would be your ideal headliner at your ideal festival? It doesn't have to be a musical act. Um, well, something for you to chew on there, but we've only got two minutes, so you can't chew on it for too long. Neil Hamilton. Oh dear. Does it have to be somebody who's alive? <laughs> Ideally, I suppose. <laughs> <That's helpful. laughs> no, I would, no I would have members. said Ken Dodd. <laughs> Ken Dodd, headlining a festival. <laughs> well, yeah, that would be an interesting one. William Cleuston. You get value for money because it would never end. <laughs> That's true. Uh, easy. Uh, the Men That Couldn't Hang, the best uh, band of its type in the world. Is that... It's, never, it's it's we have never heard of that. No, I haven't. But they're, they're, they're a sort of um, I, it's a sort of the band that couldn't hang. The, the men that the couldn't me, hang. The, the men that couldn't hang. What kind of music it's, is this? It's it's sort of uh, very fast, uh, hard folk, like the Pogues, but better. Oh, no wonder I've never heard of yeah. it. Uh, Julie Gerling. <laughs> I think I'll go for something a bit more mainstream that hopefully people have heard of. Um, I would like to see uh, Joni Mitchell, who I think is a fabulous act. Okay. I'm afraid Steve? I like I like something a bit more bouncy. I like Swedish House Mafia, and um, give me give me garlands what? any day. Swedish <laughs> House Mafia. What on earth is that? <laughs> is it is it? I mean, I love Swedish bands like Roxette and um, Abba. Abba. <laughs> and I like I like my dance music. Is I'm going to be honest. Lovely. <laughs> well, I got more than I bargained for that. Yeah, Neil, Neil Hamilton, William Clouston, Steve Radford, Julie Gurley, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Remember, you can catch up on Cross Question on the Cross Question podcast or on our YouTube channels. Coming up in the next hour, uh, we are going to talk about Prince Andrew because many of you will have seen the interview on Saturday. If you didn't see it, um, well, you've probably heard about it in the news. I want to know what you think Prince Andrew should do now because he doesn't seem to think that it went too badly for him. Every Everybody else does, but he doesn't. Now, um, he's also on the front page of the Evening Standard today, accused of using the N-word. Well, Jackie Smith, my compatriot in the For The Many podcast, she related in the latest episode, which you can listen to now, that he made some very inappropriate remarks about Arabs at a state dinner for Saudi Arabia. We'll be playing you the clip from that in just a moment. But I want to know, what do you think should happen to Prince Andrew now? On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. LBC.